Hi, thanks for joining us for the Otis Burnson Media One Question interview. Um, this is the Spring Series, and my name is Jules McKean, and I run the media practice out of London for Otis Burnson Executive Search. Today, I'm pleased to be joined by James Kirkham from Defective Records. James, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me, Jules. Very welcome. Um, acknowledged as an authority in all things marketing, public relations, and content creation. James joined Effective Records as Chief Business Officer in January 2020 for this bizarre year we've just had, overseeing all social content, marketing and PR activations at the company. Making the move to the independent label from an advertising and marketing background, James has just concluded, had just concluded four years at the football media company Copa 90, where during his tenure as, as Chief Business Officer, he oversaw a 100% increase in revenue year on year, coordinating partnerships with brands such as Puba, Budweiser, Nike, Pepsi and EA Sports. As one of the industry's leading industry speakers, James has established himself as a media innovator and specialist voice on the industry, providing insights for news outlets such as The Guardian, CNN, Sky News and the BBC. You didn't mention Odgers Burnson, but I'm just gonna say, obviously excellent media. I'll have them in the bio when I get, when we finish, yeah. Of course, quite right. <laughs> Prior to COVID-19, James founded his own digital advertising business holder, the first agency in the world to create a market to, to market a TV show using social media. Right, James, you joined, let's just recap, in nine in um, January 2020, two yes. months before the whole world changed. So looking back on it now, as we sit here in uh, early March, uh, early April 2021, what, if anything, has our industry learned from the pandemic? Oh my gosh, an awful lot in a nutshell. Uh, let me try and expand. So Defected, yeah, is a record label. It's been going 22 years. It's got huge kind of back catalogue and archive and known for an awful lot of probably dance uh, hits that many of your uh, viewers and audience will remember from like Roger Sanchez's first number one to like Kings of Tomorrow finally and many a great record and many a great night has been had. It has, when I joined, I, I'd already described it really as this almost new era music company, more than a label in the respect that five, six, seven records come out every single week. You know, music is its staple, but we also have events and we have a really big community. And it's those kind of ingredients that felt special. All of that said, nothing would have prepared us for that kind of moment where we shelved our parties. We'd normally have you know, sort of countless festivals in the summer. We would have an entire Ibiza season, a defective festival in Croatia for five days. Uh, all these kind of events, our imprint glitter box, big dance kind of uh, takeovers and club nights in Ibiza and so on. So everything stopped, literally. Um, and I guess we didn't plan to innovate our way out of it. We did plan to double down on things like social content, storytelling, because we knew if there's one uh, thing we could guarantee is people spend a lot of time, frankly, with their screens for good or bad, but we were able to tell stories. We were able to still speak to people, communicate, bring them music and so on. But it was the shelving of the events that led us very, very swiftly to wonder if we could do an event in a different way. Right. We have such a lovely crew community. We, if you recall back then, just over a year ago now, there was a lot of fear actually. There was a huge amount of uncertainty. I mean. In some ways there still is, but it was a far more unsure, unclear kind of uh, landscape in front of us all. So one of the things we wanted to do was bring people together in a joyous moment and bring some positivity where frankly there wasn't a lot. Mm. So um, at that point we created a, a virtual festival, a, a chance for people to get on their own dance floors in their lounges and kitchens and living rooms, uh, play great house music with brilliant DJs, in a way that was just streamed on YouTube and Facebook and Twitch and so on. And this has become kind of commonplace now, but then it was sort of first out yeah. the blocks doing it and it got a lot of noise as a consequence. Um, that one-off event, we were meaning as a one-off. We wanted to just put something down, bring people together and, you know, and then sort of carry on as it were. But the reaction was such, uh, and people said, right, you've got to be here every week now. This is it. This is our Friday. So we ended up doing some 10 weeks during the lockdown um, uh, on a Friday afternoon evening in the UK, which sort of became like a punctuation point in a week, just as many, well, people were almost after that like linear moment yeah. that 
frankly, though, I think people are after an excuse to have a beer probably on a Friday afternoon. And, and a shared experience, maybe. But everybody, there's yeah. something about the scheduling aspect of that that means that you feel, you know that you're having a shared experience even if you can't see the other people. A hundred percent, yeah. Like, um, the feedback loop, you know, if we're talking in industry terms, was probably what I didn't expect to, to just be... Well, frankly, it was moving. We had... Um, we had NHS workers sending us video and, 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 and images of them in an ambulance on their lunch break or, or some kind of break, coffee break, dancing in their ambulance. Wow. We, had a, we had a guy who got himself in Greece out of his hospital bed and he's still plugged into some drip and he's dancing with a laptop on a corner. I mean, wow. it, was kind of, it was absurdly touching yeah. how connected we could be with these very people who were suddenly unable to dance with us for real. So that was like an example, I guess, of where we didn't plan it. We genuinely didn't. It wasn't like a big strategic, right, we will replace physical events with a virtual. But we, we caught a moment. We did it in a reactive, emotional state. But then it became commercially interesting and viable. I, these are free. We raised over a million dollars for the COVID relief fund. We've since done events for Mind, the mental health charity, for the Trussell Trust, for food banks, like brilliant purpose-driven stuff. But it also commercially viable for defective because, of course, there are continual showpiece of records. We didn't have clubs. We didn't have dance floors to listen to the new track from, I don't know, Calvin Harris or Boys Noise or whatever great records we've been putting out. So it also was, a, I guess, in a way, a window to these records being played by amazing people from Carl Cox, the Martinez brothers. People were still able to engage their artists or DJs where perhaps previously it had suddenly been taken away. And I think that's a, that was a, a big part of it. I think from an artist and DJ's and talent perspective, this whole time has been a learning too, because, you know, they probably won't mind me for saying, but back then, just over a year ago, it was very easy to stand. If you're a band, you know, you know, the major labels have said this as well. If you're a band, you can stand on a stage, you can be at arm's length. You can take your money for standing on that stage. Same with DJs. Um, they, everyone's had to lean in more. Everyone's had to properly go out of their way to engage a community and audience, their fans, because they've not been able to do it in the traditional normal means. And in a strange way, perhaps paradoxically, because we've lived so much through screens, I think one of the great learnings is this idea of proximity that mm -hmm. bands, artists, labels, people like Defected Music is is effectively perhaps finding or rediscovering with their fans and audience. They can't afford to be solely how they once were. And I think we're going to see an era and a time where artists, bands, DJs have never been closer to their fans. And it might be, it might be taking familiar, um, familiar kind of pillars, if you like, of an experience like backstage passes or meet and greets or signing tents and adding those as little virtual layers to your ticket. So fingers crossed if we're all back in some way, shape or form this year in 2021, I suspect we'll see an awful lot of hybrid experiences where you might buy your ticket, but you can see a virtual backstage pass or you can yeah. meet an artist on Zoom or you can uh, gift your a pass to three friends who can't make it to Croatia or things like that. Born Happy from a birthday moment. for a mate or something like that. All of those things, so right. And, it, and it's all about that closeness and it's about the richer experience. And, in it, and that's one positive out of what's been an unbelievably tricky time. Do you, do you think that, in a, is, has there been a sort of another unintended consequence of all the work that you guys have done moving from live experience to, you know, kind of live online experience or, you know, kind of bringing to life something in the online world where newer younger audiences that may not have connected with early dance music i feel definitely seems to be a re, you know a real resurgence anyway gen z's getting into the 90s uh, and that's just a personal observation but do, do you think that that has maybe broken down some of those generational artist issues yeah i do i mean i think a lot of those barriers have been broken down full stop and it works both ways and the example yeah. you just gave absolutely we did a so, so the virtual festival I mentioned was just one of, and they're actually a whole myriad. The virtual festival is the one everyone probably noticed, but we did stuff like, we just we reached into our own archives, play, replayed classic sets, Simon Dunmore playing Mambos and a classic kind of sundowners, sunset moment um, from quite a few years ago now, like replaying that on a Sunday in lockdown when we had a captive audience and the sun was out and 
just went tremendously well. And to your exact point, young audiences, there's a whole bunch of people who'd never seen it before, which is kind of yeah. lovely. And the growth we've seen in our community means we're continually considering and thinking that too. We're like, do you know what? They might not know that record yet. They might not realize where that producer come from. They might not know that that's a remix of, like that's really yeah. nice. That you can start weaving this universe or retelling that to young audiences or just new audiences. Much of the work we're doing right now on Twitch as a platform, a lot of it's a big US audience. And we know full well, there's a, again, a whole bunch of people discovering some of these records for the first time, which is lovely. It works the other way as well. I mean, if we hold an event um, and fingers crossed, we're gonna be like I say, back soon in July with a big event. Um, but even perhaps one of our last events say at Printworks, which is I think a 5,000 capacity, wonderful, incredible, beautiful like moment, but it's 5,000. Yeah. Now a virtual event, you could be expecting a good million views live, let alone all the people who catch up on demand. What's most interesting about that is not some kind of vanity exercise. It's more the fact that you know that there are people all around the world in countries who simply couldn't have come to that event. They couldn't have made it for whatever reason, simple logistics, geographical, whatever. Or there's a whole age group too who, yeah. I don't know, there's a 40, 50 year old age group. They're not gonna probably go to that kind of slightly sweaty dance floor style place, but they still bloody love music and they're really into the house music and they've connected as well. So you've seen, all access, access to all. We've seen cross-generational, we've seen parents introducing their kids, kids looking at a DJ for the first time, perhaps learning to DJ or realizing yeah. that they quite like them or they like the swagger of this person and discovering. So being able to just provide discovery is just everything. Allowing people to hear things for the very first time, be it an artist or a record is a really great thing. That's brilliant, James, thank you. I think that idea of sort of creating an, an, a platform for discovery in, in kind of, you know, off the back of what might be perceived as a sort of last decade or two's worth of real commercialization and commoditization of, in, in, the, in, in um, the music industry is really interesting because, you know, that it hasn't, it hasn't been a conversation piece around the dinner table and perhaps it, 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 until very recently. It, I feel that there has been a resurgence in that kind of intergenerational chat. Totally. And I think, I think for a while, a lot of people perhaps disconnected from the music industry, or as you say, perhaps almost a generation older, were almost forgiven for, for assuming that the last thing they remembered was about 17, whatever it was, 17, 18 years ago when Napster came out and everything changed and they might assume it's in ruins. Now, it's actually not because we know yeah. through streaming, there are many labels in Rude Health and making, you know, whether you're, I don't know, a label like Warner Music and Ed Sheeran, and huge, big numbers, you know, streaming numbers. So it's a it's a highly kind of commercialized, lucrative, valuable industry for so many, again, which is fantastic and has been fantastic. But what this has brought on is a couple of other elements whereby your point on discovery is, it's like this creative discovery. So we did a virtual event, we then pioneered some stuff within Twitch in a different way. And we kept trying to push things and people noticed, but I was sat there wishing I had done the Travis Scott piece in Fortnite or marveling at the visuals of Tomorrowland or, um, uh, the Minecraft festival where people had digital door policies and virtual club toilets. And these are like open world in-game clubbing. It's a, I've called it before, like this creative arms race right now. And it's all built around that discovery. And it's, it's a brilliantly chaotic time. There won't be any one winner, I don't think for another year or two in terms of platform or place. And is it gonna be more dance music within gaming environments? Yeah. Is be more the virtual is it going to be more virtual reality is it AR there's going to be so much all of it though is built for the consumer so if you're a fan of music you're in a brilliant position right now because there is a whole load of ways you can hear your music find your music discover your music and probably connect to artists and records so it's an exciting time it's a chaotic time in that respect yeah. but it's very inspiring James that's brilliant I mean got so much unpack it's, it's really exciting and let's just hope that you know, some of the stuff that we've learned from this year carries on and things don't go back to the status quo. You know, as Pat, Pat Young was saying on the one that I did with him last week, let's remember the status quo, the way it was, wasn't all that great. And the stuff that we could have improved on and hopefully we can keep keep firing on forward and do some really interesting stuff. Thank you so much for joining me, James Kirkham from Defective Records. Thanks very much. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.